Okay, it is Wednesday morning. The Patriots are not practicing, which means Doug Kite is back, the people's favorite guest, <laughs> and he and I have, uh, I, I would assume, I know I have, showered off all of the sunscreen, all of the sweat, all of the just filth that's sitting on that media hill, which was compounded when we played an excellent media flag football game. <laughs> Notice the come at the end. Though if I'm being honest, I think all like 90% of the social media interaction was just fellow media. And <laughs> like him. Oh, yeah. That. Video clips, there were tweets. Matt Doloff and Alex Barth, excellent folks from 98.5, were live tweeting parts of this as we played in the Gillette Stadium field for all of uh, 25 minutes before we ended with the dislocated kneecaps. So Not us. People really want to know since I dropped the, that. But the, uh, the collection of media did. But yeah, yes, our, our, our kneecaps are in the right place. Yes, that's that's very true. A single kneecap. Um, anyway, more on that later. So here's the plan today. We're going to zoom out after diving into... Pat's Eagles, very quickly, everything that happened. If you really want to know, uh, Doug and Zach and I combined on notes for this close to 3,000-word recap of everything they had. Doug and Zach also had separate stories. Read all of those. Now, I know you're listening to this and then is asking you to make extra work, but I'm just telling you, you get every single one-on-one, seven-on-seven, 11-on-11, depth chart changes, rotations, uh, penalties, sacks, catches, whatever you want, it's all in there. Take the time and go find it. Now, if you were running into someone at the supermarket today, Doug, and they said, oh, I forgot. The Eagles were at practice yesterday. How was it? What's your one-minute version of how yesterday went? I I focus mostly on the offense. So I would say that yesterday's joint practice with the Eagles should probably be a wake-up call for the Patriots about their offensive line just because there were so many sacks. Um, I think, what was it, 10 on 44 dropbacks? So I had one that, uh, and this is a good point to make just quickly. Yeah. When we're on the media hill, there are no definitive sacks. Very right. rarely does the coach blow the whistle and say, move it back here. That was definitely a sack. It's up to the media to judge on an individual basis when the defender runs by the quarterback and sometimes the quarterback scrambling, whether that would have resulted in a sack. So you and I differed. You had nine or 10. I ended up with 11. Okay, 11. And for me, it was 11 out of 44. A 25% sack rate. For Patriots quarterbacks, anyway. All right, I interrupted your supermarket conversation. <laughs> yeah, so 11 sacks on 44 dropbacks. And that was not only the backup offensive line protecting Drake May, that was also the starting offensive line protecting Jacoby Brissett. Um, and, I mean, any chance that Drake May had at the end of practice in 11-on-11s 11 on, 11 on driving his offense down the field was completely wrecked by the offensive line because there was three sacks on four dropbacks. May made a decent point after practice saying that in a game, maybe he would have scrambled away or got away and made a play on the run. But like still the point stands that there was Eagles defenders in his face almost immediately after the snap. And that's assuming that the snap from Antonio Maffi got to him in the first place, uh, which it didn't once on, on Tuesday. And it's, Again. it seems like every day there's a blown snap from Antonio Maffi. Uh, great guy, good guard. Doesn't look like a center so far, but I don't know. I just think that this should be a wake up call that things could get this bad during a joint practice because the wide receivers can beat Eagles defensive backs. The tight ends can beat Eagles safeties and linebackers. The quarterbacks are making some pretty decent throws when there's, when there's time for them to make them, but everything is just going to be destroyed if the offensive line stays this bad. Yeah, the way I put my intro was like, look, Gerard Mayo has discussed the, the success of the season is not going to be about wins and losses, right? It's not going to be in highlights or how much Drake May plays or even how well Drake May plays because they're already counting on him. They're counting on him to be a part of the foundation. And that's what Gerard wants to see is how many foundational pieces do we have in the roster for this rebuild? Well, the foundation of their offense is obviously the offensive line. Mm -hmm. And that's a leaky, crumbling mess. <laughs> like it's yeah. it's worse than we thought. And I'm, I'm going to hold back on some notes I have about – you know, just the general takeaways. We're three weeks into camp, and that's what the heart of this episode is going to be about. I think that's totally true. I peaked a little bit at the defense and alternated early, then committed to watching the offense. And I would say they stood up to a freaking loaded Eagles offense for most of the day. Mm -hmm. Not just, oh, Jalen Hurts and Saquon Barkley's hanging out now. You got A.J. Brown. You got Devontae Smith. Dallas Goddard at tight end going up against Jabril Peppers and Kyle Duggar. You had an excellent offensive line dealing with the defensive front we know has taken some hits, specifically with Christian Barmore. They did their jobs. Again, more notes on that. Um, but is this – you mentioned a wake-up call. Like, is this get out of bed, there's a fire in the house? Or is this, 
hey, you really need to get your just bleep together in a way that everyone kind of knew, but you're running out of last second chances here if you're the Patriots dealing with their offensive line. I mean, they don't really have the choice of the the first. <laughs> like, yeah, that they're firing. I was like, because like they're they can't find a firefighter off off the street right now. Like, there's not a left tackle to be found out there. The issue, what this really boils down to for me, is that I think they do need to try more offensive line combinations. The one that I've been pushing for is Chikuma Korfor at left tackle. That would put Michael Wenu at right tackle and the rookie Layden Robinson at right guard. City Southall left guard. David Andrews at center. The issue with every single offensive line combination the Patriots have is that they don't have a left tackle. They don't have anyone who is more comfortable playing left tackle than they do at a different position. So that's just an issue. Chikuma Okorafor might be the best option at left tackle on the roster, but they're probably looking at him being like, but he's a better right tackle. And like they they don't want to move Michael Wenu over to left tackle. Um, Caden Wallace played right tackle for three, four years at Penn state. They've shifted him over to left tackle. Like clearly they still like the idea of him as a right tackle though, because that's what he's playing a lot in practice. Um, so yeah, that's just what the issue issue boils down to. And unless they really do sign David Bakhtiari, which even if they did that, there's no guarantee that he's going to stay healthy for more than two or three games. And then maybe it's just a waste of money. And or wants to come some- here. As right, and wants but, to come here exactly because yeah. like I'm not sure what the the benefit for him is at that point in coming to the Patriots, but unless like there's that sort of move out there, they're just never going to find that perfect group. But if you're looking for the best five, as consistent as Vidarian Low has been, you know, to people in the building, I just can't imagine a scenario where he is really one of the best five that they can put out there for Week One. Okay, let's let's table the offensive line conversation it was the big takeaway from yesterday but again like we're going to dive into you have four takeaways i have four and we're going to overlap at some point but we'll expound on that given not just yesterday but three weeks of training camp and the preseason which is 14 practices um one thought though that you just you just mentioned the darian low to people inside the building has been their most consistent option and you can see it on the field because he started at left tackle for eight straight practices after Caden Wallace had four cracks at it and Chuk Sakor for was there for the first two practices and has just gone home since and doesn't want to play anymore because he's a right yeah. tackle. And he started. Can you expound at all on that, what they're seeing uh, with Lull or just the line big picture and then we'll move on to other topics? Yeah, no, I, I just think that it is that they've – believe that low and Chikuma core four are the most consistent options there at tackle that, you know, those have been the best guys through the beginning of camp. That's why they're still out there right now. That's why they've been in those positions for what, eight, nine days, whatever it is. But, and, and that can be true, but also not be the best option. I think like if you still have the option of moving Michael Winter to right tackle, I still think that that's a better option, but yeah, that's just what it boils down to. And, you know, I, I honestly thought, and maybe this is still the case, it's a new offense, uh, new system that Scott Peters is is teaching the offensive line, new offensive line coach in Scott Peters, new offensive coordinator in Alex Van Pelt. Like maybe some of these guys who did struggle last year, a guy like Vidarian Lowe, could be better this year. But then when you see how bad the offensive line was in a joint practice with the Eagles, that's what I'm talking about for a wake-up call that you kind of have to take a step back and be like, all right, maybe it was working against our guys, but maybe we need to second think this um, and try some other options before the season starts. Because Gerard Mayo said that he wants the starting offensive line settled before the third preseason game. That is like nine days away at this point, 10 days away. So that's getting really close. And I'm not sure if a preseason game is the best time to trot out a new offensive line combination. We'll see if they do it on Thursday. But personally, that seems like kind of a dangerous scenario. Yeah, it does. Uh to the point about Gerard wanting that done in about nine days, it's like sending in your Christmas list loaded with items that take two weeks to build. <laughs> right. Uh, it's someone who's not equipped to f- play Santa uh, as much as you might like and expecting to get that all done by the time the 25th rolls around. Okay. We're going to move on from the offensive line, yeah. but I'll just say this about yesterday. It, it both went as expected mm-hmm. when you had an NFC contender who has addressed some needs on defense. And again, is freaking loaded on offense because the Patriots defense looked good towards the end. Their offense completely collapsed. It doesn't mean there weren't good moments. Drake may have one of his longest best completions of the day in seven on sevens. Okay. It's seven on sevens. You want to move on fine. He went three of three 
in another period. Jacoby Brissett had a couple of touchdown passes on yep. the move, and Drake clearly was processing. It's just that he resulted in some decisions that arrived and go, I don't have any good answers. And at that point, he was sacked. Mm -hmm. So it both was bad, and I, I saw uh, our, our colleague, Greg Bedard, long-time respect yeah. for his work, describe this as traumatic because he uh, said it reminded him of the practice two years ago with Matt Patricia, which ended with David Andrews holding his own huddle and screaming his head off at everyone, which has since been revealed to me that that was like, look, this is a situation where you're just going to have to deal with it if you want to bitch and complain. Uh, I That's no way to live. But like, this is what we've got to do. we got to push through this. This is not that. It was really bad from the standpoint yeah. of the offensive line could not block. But that practice two years ago, one of the worst, maybe the worst I've ever seen, was undercut by how many free rushers you had like there were systematic right. failures yeah. of scheme and organization and coaching this was the player stink right and we know the player stink so that's just a really really important line that i want to draw because you can see the vision of the alex van pelt offense and what scott peters is trying to do as a first off first year up as a line coach i don't know if he's going to get there but that's it's a really really important distinction we knew the whole picture everything was bad under patricia uh this is not that yeah i also I, like I know that I came out with the take that this needs to be a wake up call for the Patriots, but I also think that like, like you said, the defense held its own against the Eagles' offense, and like I mentioned, wide receivers can get separation, like tight ends are making plays, quarterbacks are making throws. It's not all bad. It just boils down to that one unit that is an issue right now. So, I I, I wouldn't call you know Tuesday's practice traumatic. I, I think that it was overall bad because of one unit but there's still potential hope that that could be fixed so i i wouldn't say it was yeah that that's all i'll say i guess yeah and some some fixes potentially even or upgrades i would say in other positions so i have my four thoughts spoiler the o-line is one of them i don't want to talk <laughs> about them anymore i need a break i need i need just a timeout from that group uh lead us off what you have four big picture takeaways it's not a super market chat. You're hanging out. Someone comes to the house and they just want to chat Pats for an hour. And you've got like now 40 minutes because that's what we have. Uh, what's your first, what's your first takeaway that you're, you're sharing? Um, I'll, I'll start off with this one because I think that you know that it's coming. I'm wearing the University of Washington shirt, but like Jalen Polk <laughs> just needs to start. And they, yeah. they need to stop messing around with these starting wide receivers because it, it's, it's very clear that Demario Douglas is the Patriots' best wide receiver. He's a slot wide receiver. We'll probably see him play some Z during the season, but he does his best work out of the slot. Jalen Polk, Patriots second round pick, looks like the best outside wide receiver on the roster. He's been the most consistent. Like you know what you're getting out of him when, when he when you throw him the ball. He's got really strong hands, and he has the potential to make big plays, which is one that we saw in a one on one uh, from Drake May on Tuesday, and we've seen other. You, we've seen him make other big plays throughout training camp. So it's not all just what we saw in that preseason game where it's like short routes and catching the ball, you know, in some traffic or whatever. Like, no, he can go deep and get the ball as well. So last week against the Panthers, uh, the Patriots starting wide receivers were Tyquan Thornton, KJ Osborne. And then I'm still trying to wrap my head around this one. Juju Smith-Schuster was the third wide receiver on the field came on the it came in in the slot when they pulled a tight end off the field and then he was cut like a day later. So that's what's kind of telling me like, that's why I say like stop messing around putting Juju Smith-Schuster out there as your third wide receiver when there's even a possibility that you're going to cut him the next day just feels like you're messing around. Just put Jalen Polk out there, put him out there for as much as he can, like give him as many snaps as possible, get him familiar with both quarterbacks. When they take the field after this preseason game, I, I want like a starting offense. I don't want them to keep rotating these wide receivers because at some point you're going to have to decide on two and 12 personnel and three and 11 personnel. And those are the guys that you want to have the best chemistry with your quarterbacks. And that needs to be Demario Douglas, Jalen Polk, and someone else. <laughs> and like, I, I don't have the take on who that third guy should be. If it's Kendrick Bourne, like if Kendrick Bourne's off pop, it should be him. I don't know what's going on with that situation. So I'm not going to like say for sure that he's going to be that third guy. And I think there's a case to be made for KJ Osborne, Tyquan Thornton, Jalen Rager, or Javon Baker. Um, I would probably lean towards it being either Osborne or Baker, because I think that Rager and Thornton 
are great fourth wide receivers that you can bring on the field when you're in, you know, 10 personnel or, you know, one personnel and just have them fly down the field. They're not going to be double covered. No one's going to be paying that much close attention to them. And there's the potential for a big play. Like those are the fourth wide receivers that you want. You might not want those guys as the third guy on the field. Completely agree. You and I talked about this in the press box after practice the other day, and I'm, you know, tabulating all the targets. Like Jalen Polk still has more than KJ Osborne. Oh, wait, he has more than Tyquan Thornton. Oh, and both of those guys have an average of one per day going on the three to last four practices, and they're still starting in all of these team periods, just like the preseason opener. What the hell's going on? Well, what's going on, just to wrap up the juju point, because this is my theory, is if you know you're going to trade or cut him, just trot him out there. Cross your fingers, your toes. Instead of giving giveaways like T-shirts or towels, just have a little card before every single seat in the stadium asking everyone to do the same. Cross your fingers that Juju makes some sort of big play so that we can sell him plus a six-round pick and maybe get a conditional seventh in return. It didn't happen to get cut. I think that was the only reason he played is just to get some tape that looks positive and persuade someone to take him. But you're right. I I think Tyquan Thornton is having a good camp. It's not better than Jalen Polk. What Mm -hmm. I wanted from Jalen Polk, who is having more catches per practice than any other receiver is more ceiling plays because he's been steady and that's great for a rookie. That's Mm -hmm. uncommon for a rookie, but there was nothing that says, Oh wow. Like I need to be aware of this. If I'm a defense or he wins that way, or this is a guy that is going to come up big. He started to do that. One ones, 11s red zone. He plays big. Polk should start period. End of story. That's that's it for me. The NFL regular season is almost here. But you don't have to waste your time watching more preseason outside of the Patriots. You can play prize picks all summer. America's number one daily fantasy sports app has over 5 million active viewers. And unlike other apps, you guys, you know that by now, you don't play against anyone. You just pick against the numbers. If you pick more or less on two to six player stat projections, you watch the winnings roll in. Even taking 10 bucks, going all the way to 1000 So sign up today and get $50 instantly when you play for just 5 bucks. You don't even need to win to receive the $50 bonus. It's guaranteed. And then when football does roll around, man, if you think Tyree Kill is going to go for over 90 yards in the season opener, Miami does pretty well in their season openers, uh, that's an easy win. If you think the Patriots defense is going to show up and hold down Joe Burrow in Cincinnati, take the under on Joe Burrow. It's that simple. It's that easy. You've heard me talk about this for the Red Sox. God willing, they'll be playing in October. You can do all kinds of sports, but get ready for football with prize picks. It's available in more than 30 states across the country. So download prize picks today and use the code CLNS for a different bonus. This first deposit match is up to a hundred bucks. That's right. Just put in CLNS on prize picks for a deposit match up to a hundred dollars. Prize picks run your game. Do you have, do you want to go second? Or do you want me to give my second one? Uh, no, I'll go one. And this okay. is, we'll, we'll stick with the receivers, uh, which one note, to, uh, well, actually two notes. So Pop Douglas is joining us at the end of this podcast. And know. it's a, it's another four minute drill, just like I had with Hunter Henry. He, uh, A, was great. B, tells us how he hurt his hand in camp in a way that was completely <laughs> unexpected. And I will leave it at that. <laughs> uh, but speaking of Pop Douglas, the second note being Kendrick Bourne, I do not expect to play at all in the preseason. Not a big surprise at this point. Yeah. Hasn't practiced all the way out there. There is a chance he does not practice at all in training camp. Uh, but he's still progressing from the ACL. That's where that stands right now. Pop back to Pop. Um, he's a he's a world changer, right? Like we yeah. we have seen the last three practices, his only three with the red non-contact jersey off. So he's a full go, full participant. You can hit him, you can do whatever. He's still got a little wrap in his hand, but he's fine. In those three practices, not only does he lead the team in catches. Not only does he set the single day high for most catches in a practice, he's developed immediate chemistry with both quarterbacks who have looked at him at the start of yeah. team periods and in the two minute drill. So if you're making a list of things that I want to see from Pop Douglas, he does those and he goes, Oh, no, no, I got more. Like he's seeking some kind of extra credit here because that's how much better he's been than the rest of the receivers. You could call it a year two leap. You could just call it a guy who's trustworthy in the slot or just an average receiver and a sucky receiving core. But Pop Douglas has completely changed not just the game, not just the offense, the whole world for everyone he's around based on his ability to just get open and catch the ball, which is the whole job. And he's been awesome. 15 catches the last three days. No one else is even close. 
Yeah, I mean, when he's on the field with a Drake May, you 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 kind of know that Drake May is immediately going to throw to him. Like, then the Drake May is like, oh, nice. I get to play with Demario Douglas on the snap. All right, I'm going to take advantage of this. Throw it to Demario Douglas. Like, yeah, he, he's automatic out there. And obviously the only concern that you have is whether or not that he can stay healthy for a full season. Uh, that didn't happen last year. But at the same time, we're also not going to see the – weird benching that he had when he fumbled and you know they're not gonna be messing around with him in that way but uh he did have the the concussion issues last season and hopefully doesn't have a repeat of that um he did say that you know he's gonna play a little bit safer this year like know when the play is over not necessarily try to you know keep fighting for extra yards if it puts himself or the or the football in danger so i think he might have kind of learned his lesson there but yeah i mean he's a he's a dangerous wide receiver and i think that that there as long as he stays healthy he should be the patriots number one wide receiver he should be the leading receiver and yards and catches after the season and and hopefully for his sake he can actually get in the end zone this year as well not be a, a repeat of jacoby myers, jacoby who's myers curse. years for his, his first touchdown the other point about pop because i don't want to make it seem like oh he's just getting the ball all the time of course he leads and catches and he's like a decent receiver you guys are blowing this out of the water that's 15 catches on 16 targets and yes, yeah. a lot of them are within 10 yards of the line of scrimmage. But Jacoby has spoken about, hey, his game's a little bit bigger than that. Like he's never going to grow past 5'8", five, 5'8 eight, five, eight and a half, right. whatever he is. He's about 180, 185. But he can go down the field vertically. And I think they're going to try some more of those. We saw this in the Jets game. I think it was week three. Uh, it should have been called for a flag running a slot fade close to the end of the first half last year. And I think they're going to go to that a little bit more with him because they do need to stretch the field. And I think he can do it. It's just, it's just completely different. And this is also something to know when we talk about the first two weeks of practice, when he, these are limited, not participating in team drills at all, that the offense naturally looked like crap yeah. <laughs> like for stretches. Yeah. And, and even sometimes in seven on sevens, when the offensive line isn't even involved, he helps offset some of those issues up front as someone who can get open immediately is working over the middle of the field and has the quarterback's trust. He's not going to make the Pro Bowl. He's not going to make an all-pro team this year, at least, uh, specific to the Pro Bowl. Who knows? Right. But it's just it, – it's – I don't know. It, it just kind of – it doesn't fix anything, but it papers over or deodorizes a lot of what's going on with the offense right now, which, as I mentioned, kind of stinks. So, okay, what's your second takeaway? Uh, cornerback is currently the deepest position on the roster. Okay. Uh, Patriots can go like Patriots are like seven or eight deep at that position right now of guys who could potentially make the roster. And uh, that being said, I still think there's a question about who that third or fourth cornerback is going to be and whether you fully trust them. But like you're talking about Christian Gonzalez at the top, Jonathan Jones will be another starter. And Marcus Jones, as long as he ever gets healthy, will be probably the third starter. At least that's what the Eagles think. That's who they were, yeah. you know, practicing against and red pennies before practice started during this walkthrough period. It was, it was those three guys, Gonzalez, Jones, and Jones as starting cornerbacks. Apparently they weren't aware that Jonathan Jones and Marcus Jones were going to go down to the side field and, and not actually participate in practice. But um, as an aside, last week after we saw Chikuma Okorafor play in a preseason game, after not practicing for the like three sessions previous to that, who knows, maybe Jonathan Jones and Marcus Jones really are out there in the game on Thursday. They uh, weren't pads yesterday. Like I, they were in I, pads, I which feeling... is more than a core four could say before he played in the preseason game. And Marcus Jones might be one of these guys who likes to go to an NBA game or an MLB game and just always wears a jersey. And some people <laughs> feel like they age out of it. I'm not one of them. I don't wear jerseys a whole lot, but he's wearing his jersey every single day to practice, whether he's yeah. in pads like yesterday or he's not like Sunday and Monday. And I'm just going, Am I gonna see you at Fenway with this kind of new, you know, like <laughs> Maybe not Jaron Duran today, no. uh, but you know, pick pick your favorite Red Sox player, and he's just wearing it and has a glove on him to catch something in the outfield <laughs> or in his luxury booth, wherever Marcus Jones might be seated. But I think you're right. You wrote about this yesterday too. Yeah. I'll I'll just push back though because I think you know. Well, we let's continue as well, just because okay. uh, beyond those three guys, then you've got um, you've got Alex Austin, Marco Wilson. Both those guys have been receiving a lot of first team reps, um, and then Sean Wade, who makes the roster every year like he's a big slot option that obviously the patriots like quite a bit even if you're not asking a question about him coaches seem to bring up sean wade um then as a seventh option or maybe you know mix him in with those other two isaiah bolden who didn't play last season uh because of the concussion you've got marcellus dial who was the patriots only defensive uh, draft pick and like <laughs> elliot wolf 
apologize to Demarcus Covington for only taking one defensive player. I don't know how it would look after doing that to also then cut that only uh, you know defensive player who was drafted. And then I, I know that he kind of you know we we started off the summer not thinking very highly of him, but. Azizi Hearn is a guy that Mike Pellegrino brings up at every single opportunity. Like he constantly singles out the improvement that Azizi Hearn has made. And like to Pellegrino's credit, Azizi Hearn really does make plays almost every day in practice. And if he was doing that at any other position, like let's say you take Azizi Hearn's camp and put him as a tight end, who's like making those same plays every day. We're probably talking about Azizi Hearn making the roster. As like as the third tight end or whatever, like if he's making the equivalent of those plays at a different position, that's a little bit lighter. Same thing like a defensive tackle, like a guy who's making that many plays, you'd be talking about is actually earning a roster spot. Whereas realistically, because he's the eighth or ninth guy on this roster, there's basically no shot for him to make the team. But like he's been a relative standout in camp just because of how many plays he's making out there at cornerback. But the flip side of that. And I, I want to get to Marco Wilson and Alex Austin, too, yeah. because I think th- it's worth noting what the hierarchy is for now, right? When Jonathan Jones goes out, who's the first to step in? Well, it's Alex Austin. And more recently for Marcus Jones, it's been Isaiah Bolden in the slot. Then Marco Wilson, fourth-year corner, who I highlighted as his forgotten Patriot, yeah. I think can make a surge to make the roster. Uh, had some not-so-kind things to say about his time with the Cardinals, even though his second year, you know, a bunch of picks, forced fumble, uh, yada, yada, started, I think, 14, 15 games. Um, Azizi Hearn, the flip side of him, which you're right in terms of pass breakups, and I haven't tabulated those totally, but he's at, at worst top five, maybe top three in yeah. terms of just total. The flip side is he's getting burned a lot. Like there's a reason yeah. on the media hill, some have thrown out Azizi Burn instead of calling he was him early. His. It's not gonna, it's it's gotten better as the summer's gone along, I'd say. Yeah, yeah. But he's still not repping with the ones in the way that I know. Oh, Jonathan Jones is out. Well, it'll be one of these two guys, and it's Marco Wilson or right. Austin. Now, to, to pivot to those guys, because you're right, I think Azizi could make this late push. Uh, are you ready for a deep cut? A la Keon Crossan, 2018, Ooh, wow. seventh rounder. Didn't have oh, – not on anyone's 53-man yeah. roster projections and then sneaks on uh, at the very end, wins the Super Bowl ring, and goes to Miami, and God knows where he is now. But Marco Wilson gave up six catches in team periods yeah. yesterday against the Eagles. Alex Austin gave up two immediately to A.J. Brown. Giving up catches to A.J. Brown, who had 10 on 11 targets, by the way, according to our pal Zach Cox, is not some sort of grand failure or sin. A.J. Brown's really freaking good. Right. What, six catches in a practice for Marco yeah. Wilson, to me, is kind of a, hmm, maybe I need to look in the mirror the way that I feel about this player as someone I would have in my 53-man, but it's a competitive group, to your point, and he could be left yeah. out unless he kind of rebounds here. And, I mean, he was also a, what, three-year starter with the Cardinals, and you're talking yeah. about him as probably Two, being like your fifth cornerback behind Gonzalez, Jones, Jones, and Austin, fourth or fifth cornerback. Like you can do a lot worse than that than have a guy who's and like I, that's what speaks to me for the depth is that like in an ideal world you're not counting on Marco Wilson to be a starter. You're counting on him to be your fifth or sixth cornerback. And having a guy who started as many games as he has and looks pretty good in the Patriots' defense outside of that joint practice. Um, I don't know. You're just in pretty good shape. And like, I'll just throw in the last name as well. Mikey Victor, the one who stood out, I think the the least out of this group, he still makes interceptions and pass breakups. Like it's, he's still out there making plays. So uh, I think it's also a credit to, to Mike Pellegrino as a cornerbacks coach to have seen so much improvement out of all of these players since the spring and obviously cornerback is typically a position of strength for the Patriots. I think for a long time, people were just like, okay, well, if you got a talented group, whatever, like Bill Belichick is the coach. Pellegrino does a really good job with those guys every year. He does. That is a small overlap. We have a Venn diagram and like the minimal <laughs> definition of a Venn diagram with your takeaway. Talk about the corners and I have sleepers on defense because I mm-hmm. think there are, are a few guys here. They didn't, none of the corners made the top two for me, mm-hmm. but we can come back to that in a little bit because we've gone 27, 28 minutes into this podcast and we have not talked about the quarterbacks. And that is, <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, put us in the penalty box for this. And, but here's the deal. We talk about, we write about, we we listen and discuss the quarterbacks all of the time. And yeah. nothing has really changed on this front. So if you've been following along at all, if you just didn't skip the last three weeks of episodes here in this podcast or other places, you would know Drake May is not going to start week one. And it's not just because, 
Jacoby Brissett was named the starter back in the spring, and Jacoby Brissett's been taking all of the starting reps since then. And Drake May is kind of underwhelmed, and I've used the letter grade C, C plus so far. It's because he's not ready, and that's okay. Which is not to give you a blanket and a binky to make you feel better at home. It's just to state the reality of a 21 year old quarterback coming from two different college offenses, which are nothing like the pro style system he's getting used to. Oh, and he's dropping under center for the first time. Oh, and he's relaying 15, 16 more play calls. With all of that included, we want to get to the info you really care about and know. 60% on the dot completion percentage for me in team periods through 14 practices. A 2.5% interception rate. Better than Jacoby Percet, as is this number. 8.6% sack rate. So why is Drake May not ready if he's got a lower interception rate and a lower sack rate than Jacoby Brissett? Jacoby Brissett's uh, pick rate, by the way, is just over 3% and his sack rate is 9.1, neither of which are good. Jacoby is more accurate. He's more decisive. He's better downfield. And you get the benefit of the doubt when you know where to look and what to do. I don't think you disagree with me on this, but what did I miss? And just kind of re, just kind of checking in on the quarterback situation. Uh, what? How will your feelings change if Drake May comes out on Thursday and this could, you know, this take could, could wind up like sour milk here, but like, what if he comes out on Thursday and looks really good? What if he completes 65% of his passes, throws a touchdown, no interceptions, but also picks up like 40 valuable yards on the ground. And then you see that he looks better in a game than he doesn't practice he probably still will look better in seven on sevens than, than in a game or 11 yeah. on 11. But like, maybe what if you, what if you see him do that? And like, maybe the 11 on 11 structure isn't the best gauge of his talent. Does your mind change at all? If he plays well in this preseason game. So my mind will not change a whole lot because I'll treat this as really one data point within a set of at least 15. If you go back to the spring, there's more and mm -hmm. the preseason should be weighted more heavily than a non padded practice. Don't get me wrong. But what I will what I will be relieved, what I will be happy about is the way that the discourse will hopefully change at least a little bit, which I shouldn't care about, right? Is my computer goes off to remind me saying Drake May is not that bad. Um, it's just to say that like the outsized reaction from all the numbers and the tweets that you and I have have been like, yeah, he's been fine. It's not been bad. It's not been great. There's not one practice where you go, there's a franchise guy yet. Right. And that gets spun as, well, we can't discuss this on TV and radio. Like, it's fine. What's the tease like when I say he's a CC plus? More after the break. No one's sticking around for that. So it's, oh, my God, he sucks. What are they doing? They're failing him. Who's to blame? Who can we put, you know, on the stage and, you know, whatever, throw tomatoes at it or just, just scream at it? So I think if he plays well, I'll be excited because he'll have some success in the way that I think he's been, he's been very patient in the way he wants to play. He wants to do what his coaches are telling him. Find the check down, protect the ball. His footwork is cleaned up, according to Alex Van Pelt. That's definitely been better. But he's not playing the backyard style, which is ultimately going to elevate this offense as a dude who can create on his own. What you're talking about, at least as I heard it, is a guy who's creating on his own scrambles, off-platform throws, chucking it downfield. That guy has been missing through camp. So if we see him on Thursday, I'll be happy for him. I'll be happy for me. And I'll be happy that he's still in there because we just haven't seen it in a while. I, my, my other question on this is, okay. So last year we, Bill Belichick said over and over again, it's going to be a quarterback, quarterback competition. Like everyone has to earn their role, whatever. We all expected heading into training camp that Mac Jones and Bailey Zappi would be splitting first team reps that this would be a legitimate competition between those two guys and training camp would decide it all. And what wound up happening was that Mac Jones took all of the first team reps. Like maybe did, yeah. I think it was, it was all of them. Right. Yeah. And now a year later, we expect this to be a quarterback competition between Jacoby Brissett and Drake may we hear, you know, all year that's gonna be a competition that Brissett is the starter for now. And now we're three weeks into training camp. And Jacoby Brissett has received every single first team rep. Drake May has taken every single second team rep. And the only time he's played behind the starting offensive line is in a preseason game that he played six snaps. I just, first of all, it's, it is odd to me that this is the way that they're handling it, but also like, I, I don't want to be the Drake May defender and like still act like he's going to start in week one, because that's just not a realistic situation based on no. what we're seeing in training camp. But I, there's also a part of me that's thinking, 
has he gotten a fair shake? Like, has he gotten a fair opportunity to actually compete with Jacoby Brissett for the starting role when he's not getting first team reps, when he's not getting tested, when he's not getting protected by the starting offensive line in practice. And ultimately, I don't know what my point here is, except that it's an odd way of handling it. I'm not sure if it's been a totally fair competition. And in a lot of ways, it feels like deja vu going back to last summer when we were expecting a quarterback competition and then none transpired and the starter was decided all along. It, it just feels like that again to me. Breaking news. We've got a young, exciting underdog team in Boston that's making a run for the playoffs. No, it's not the Patriots. Well, not the Patriots yet. It's the Red Sox. And if you've been following this season, you know that the Red Sox have been a hotter ticket ever since the season started. I want you to get down to Fenway with Game Time, an authorized ticket marketplace in Major League Baseball, where you will find killer last minute deals, all in pricing, including those pesky fees, views from your seat, and the lowest price guarantee. Guys, you've heard me talk about Game Time before. And look, whether you are in New England, whether you're down in New York, whether you're out on the West Coast, you can browse through the Game Time app to find any seat you want, customize your spot, flash deals, zone deals. I've done this before, gone to a Yankee series. You could go to a makeup date, whatever it is to get you back into baseball with one of the best seasons we've had so far, especially for the Red Sox. And you can do this, again, with the lowest price guaranteed. I don't care where you get your tickets, but they should be now with the Game Time app, which you can download right now. Create an account and use code CLNS for $20 off your first purchase. Terms do apply. All you need to do is create an account and redeem this code CLNS for $20 off your first purchase. It could be MLB, WNBA, concerts, etc. Just go to game time today. Find last minute tickets in the lowest price guaranteed. So your first word that ran to my head is... is uh, not one I want to share this podcast. You're upset. Are you? Are you still? You st- are you unhappy about Zappy? You think Zappy got a fair say? That's what no, I, no. I, I, I because I, I'm teasing, but I, I'm I do also think that like but you know what I mean. Uh, like you're talking about last year, one guy gets all of the reps and oh, I, my guy Zappy. Some folks said then and they were wrong. Right. That it was ridiculous. Didn't get a fair shake. This I've never not- been a big Zappy guy, but like I will say, Zappy eventually passed Mac Jones on the depth chart and like probably played a little bit better than him. I don't even know. Like they were both so bad that it doesn't really matter who was better. But like at the end of the day, it was closer between those guys and they let on during training camp. Well, Billy Zappi got cut. So I don't know if I would go that far. But then but then Mac Jones got benched and Bailey Zappi started over him for the last you, what six games? You know what happened there? And you've played Mario Kart, yes? Yeah. So and you can't really rage quit in that game. You have to finish, even if you two are the last and you're playing with someone else. And I'm going like back N64 vintage retro days. What happened there was not Matt Bailey Zappi pulling up on the left side and going from eighth to seventh and passing Mac Jones. Mac Jones got so frustrated, as we've seen before, and went backwards on the course. Says, I'm not going to finish. I'm just going to drive the opposite way. And Bailey Zappi was like, oh, I passed him just by sitting here or being unable to get out of this corner. That's what happened, I think, last year. Which I no mean, Bailey Zappi didn't pass him, but Mac Jones <laughs> fell behind. I wouldn't say he ran. That's what I'm saying. He like, went backwards was so on the course. bad. He, yeah. I don't know. I, I still... I don't know. I mean, like when you look at their, I'm looking at their PFF grades. They both had 52.2. They just both happened to have the exact same PFF offensive grade last season, 52.2. But I don't know. I mean, I, I don't want to go back to last year, obviously, but no one I, do wants think, to hear about this. I do but think, I do think that like Matt Drake may, you aren't screwing anything up by being like, all right, let's give him a run with the first team. Let's give him like one, one drive. Let's give him one series. Let's give him one turn with a starting offensive line just to see how this looks. I'm just a little bit confused why it hasn't happened. And they're being so conservative with him and they're being so safe with him that I think that they could they could test him a little bit more. So I want to make a, a point here and then pivot because we got to go back to the offensive line. And then I will have time for my defensive standouts because I just want everyone to have a, a, a decent middle of the week in case Thursday's preseason game goes as badly as the practice that we saw for the offense on Tuesday. You cannot talk about the quarterbacks, Brissett, May, how they're being handled, how they're performing. Again, I'll just share them back to back. Here's Jacoby Brissett through 14 practices. A 66.8% completion percentage. This is seven on sevens and 11 on 11s. Six interceptions, uh, 21 sacks. Drake May, 60.060% completion percentage, five interceptions uh, on fewer dropbacks, and he has a lower sack percentage because he's got 17 total. So that's that's what it is. There's a gap. 
you can't talk about the quarterbacks though without the offensive line because the Patriots do not have enough able bodies to fill out a viable second offensive line. They arguably don't have mm-hmm. enough to fill out one. So that context, not only just in assessing Drake May and the numbers that I just provided, which are not good for practice, would certainly not be good enough for a game, need to be, uh, again, it, it all needs to be contextualized because I would argue it's not that Drake May's earned more starting reps. But what you need to do is have an environment that's conducive to evaluation. Let you know, do yourself a favor as a front office and Gerard Mayo and Alex Van Pell to know what you actually have by giving him a chance to actually perform and show his abilities. Yes. He can't do that when Kellen Deitch is at left tackle, all due respect, and Zuri Henry's at right tackle. It's just not functional. So he needs more time with the starting offensive line. Yeah. I think you and I are in agreement. It just has to happen. I don't care about the receivers, honestly. Just get him right. The receivers are mixed around so much anyway that doesn't fully matter. He's still playing with top wide receivers at times, but no, I I just you. I'd want. I want to see him. If I was in an evaluation role, I would want to see what he looks like behind a better offensive line. And maybe we see that on Thursday. We'll see. But like, it is still odd that it's never happened in practice. That for three weeks that has not happened yet of him starting behind the the top offensive line. Right. Okay. So my takeaway in the offensive line, uh, we talked about Demar Douglas, world changer. Uh, May is not ready. He's in a second takeaway. We got sleepers on defense that I think are real. The offensive line is worse than we saw, and that's really a bummer. Uh, Chooks Corfor has not been at right tackle for more than two weeks. He's also missed some practices. Caden Wallace had some real rookie moments in one-on-ones, team periods. He's mostly stayed at right tackle. So if Darian Lowe, I'll say it again, eight straight practices now at the starter at left tackle. Nine, if you want to include the preseason game, we'll see what Thursday brings. And then you only have two guys that you can count on to reliably snap the ball. David Andrews and Nick Leverett, who you looked this up as we were talking about it the other day, 42 career snaps at center in his three years in Tampa Bay before getting here. So it's not Antonio Monty. And he had some miscues at center as well early in camp. Early in camp, for sure. They cleaned up a little bit, but it, it wasn't automatic for him at first. So the big issue is... You have to feel the left tackle at all times, unless we they want to run that old four O line lineup from the Ravens divisional round game in 2014. Um, it's then sparked more rule changes, but they don't have a left tackle. If you include a core four and City Sow, you're still just at four starting caliber offensive linemen, one of whom who really struggled early as a rookie is back at his old position. And a core four is like replacement level because he signed a one year contract before free agency started. This is a guy who didn't know or didn't want to test his market. And sign with the Patriots anyway. Uh, I don't think I'm wrong here, but if you have anything to add, we can put a bow in this online conversation. No, not really. I, I would just like to see Layden Robinson get yes. some more run. See if see if that could help things. Even that, if that you still don't have a left tackle. Yeah. And like, yeah, a core four better as a right tackle than a left tackle, but you have to put someone at left tackle. And I'd still probably rather put a core four at left tackle than Vidarian Low. Um, I, I'm gonna stay in the trenches real quick. And oh, this okay. doesn't need to be a long conversation, uh, but I want to go to the defensive line because obviously this is a big conversation since Christian Barmore was diagnosed with blood clots. Uh, we still don't know his status. He was at practice on Tuesday, but was not in uniform, obviously just observing it in a hoodie and shorts. I, I think that this is a position the Patriots might scour the waiver wire uh, during roster cuts. I think the defensive tackle and offensive line are the two positions, maybe possibly safety, but I think the team has more faith in the safeties than I do. But at defensive line, you really only have two locks in this group. Is, is that accurate? You've got Devon Godshaw and you've got Daniel Aquale. I, I mean, I think third, Jeremiah Farms would need to leave like flaming dog poo on Gerard Mayo's doorstep but, if he's not going to make the roster. But, I, but I, that's there wild. is a line he, between those and the rest Jeremiah of Jeremiah Farms started like he was a practice squad player last year. And like, yes, Jeremiah Farms is likely going to make the roster, but his journey is a journey for a reason. He didn't he like didn't get into a game. He wasn't on the 53 man roster until November of last year. And he's a 26 year old. So, yes, he's probably going to make the roster. Um, but that I think that that more has to do with the depth at that position than necessarily like him being this dominant force at defensive tackle. He had a great game on Thursday, but that was with the Panthers benching 33 of their starters and Can already we stay coming with that in. Number for a second, because I heard Zos. I was in the booth doing a story when he said that, and then I heard it again on the broadcast. You there? The maximum number of starters is 26. If you include <laughs> right. kicker, punter, long snapper, maybe a returner. Yeah, so they were benching like uh, 
for example, like Andy Dalton is their second string quarterback. He was among those. So right, like backup, they, were, they were dealing without their, their starter and backup at quarterback, but Ben's 33 players inactivated them. So farms looked amazing. He was great. I think he's going to make the team. We do have to consider the competition that he was playing against the backups sure. on last year's worst NFL team. Um, I think that we all came into camp expecting Armand Watts to be a lock or near lock at defensive tackle. Armand Watts was on the field for the Patriots last defensive play against the Panthers, which for a veteran player is not a great sign in week one of the preseason. We'll see if that continues into this week. Maybe we try not to read too much into that, but when he's sharing the field with guys like Tristan Hill and um, uh, Josiah Bronson, like that's not necessarily a great sign for, for his status on the roster. And if he doesn't make the roster, then you're talking about guys like Mike Purcell, who was just signed off the street, uh, Tristan Hill, uh, Jeremiah Farms, those guys being probably the top three behind Equale and Godshaw. Uh, Sam Roberts is also in the mix, but I don't know. It's just there's still a ton up in the air at that defensive tackle position. Um, I think that Equale will be the number one fill in for Christian Barmore. He can do some of the same things, but they'll also need Farms and Hill and some of these other guys to contribute, but not a position with really a lot of depth. And we just really still have no idea who those top five guys will be at this point. I think it's fair. I was going to bring up a quality. So let's talk about them now. As far as the sleepers, I was doubtful in their apparent plan. And then confirmed by DeMarcus Covington, the defensive coordinator on Monday saying, Hey, we're going to do what we do. Words Belichick <laughs> never spoke. Ever. Right. I used to describe other teams that were like the Pete Carroll cover three Seattle teams and, you know, uh, name another coach who just had this, uh, you know, marriage like fidelity to a system, uh, good, healthy marriage, but you, you get what I'm, I'm talking about mm -hmm. because they've just plugged a player in for Christian Barmore. And I right. argued he had a type of gravity and a type of attention and, and, uh, you know, talent that would allow you to manipulate opponents' attentions to him and you would drop different plays, yada, yada, yada. Patriots have just said, we're going to plug a Daniel Quali and see how it goes. That's a guy who's a third down specialist. Mm -hmm. for most of his career gets hurt last year comes back same injury as Matt Judon torn bicep the week before against the Jets and he doesn't come back Tuesday's practice against the Eagles I wrote I said was the most telling day we've had so far and maybe for the entire preseason in that practice according to Zach Cox who watched most of these and I saw a couple of these plays myself but not all two run stuffs two pressures a holding penalty drawn and might have been in on a half sack that's a Christian Barmore great day, <laughs> let alone Chris Daniel Aquale trying to be that type of player. Like this was a, an excellent impersonation of Christian Barmore at his best for Daniel Aquale. So I don't know how long he keeps that up. He might peter out. That's what I would suspect just based on his career trajectory. Yeah. Um, but the other guy I would mention as far as defensive sleepers, O'Shane Zimenez, I think is legit. Yep. And this is early. He had one and a half sacks against the Eagles. He is repping with the starters now for the last three practices. He had a forced fumble in the preseason opener against the poopy Carolina Panthers uh, and also had run stuffs in these areas. He'll need some help setting the edge as we all watched in that broadcast going the first quarter into the second. Matt Judon's coaching him up, and there's Chad Mayo saying the same thing. But that guy's going to make the roster. He's a core special teamer. He's playing on defense. He's in. Yeah, no, I, I think – I don't know. I mean, I, I have a hard time getting – was that someone cutting down my my O'Shane Zimenez take behind you? What was that? <laughs> like? So no, much, it's it's work. more uh, O'Shane Zimenez. What was the sound? Did he's you hear been that? good. He's he like, and I think that he will. He'll he'll be that like sixth edge defender. I'm just I have a hard time getting too excited about Daniel Aquali even after a good practice, just because like he's been in the league since 2019. I know that PFF grades for a defensive lineman aren't always the most accurate or dependable, but like he's topped out at a 63.1 defensive grade. Um, in 2022, he did have 22 overall pressures, uh, which is pretty solid for a defensive lineman. But like, I'd say that out of so many people on the roster, like we kind of know what Daniel Aquale is. I'd be pretty shocked if suddenly he had a, a breakout season. Uh, maybe all he needs is an opportunity to replace Christian Barmore and this is it, but he's going to be 31 years old in January. So that's already like, kind of middle age or if not older for a defensive lineman. Um, I I just, I, I don't love hearing like, we're going to do what we're going to do and just being like, okay, we're going to plug in Daniel Aquale for Christian Barmore because I do think that you need 
multiple different guys to be filling that role. I think that in an ideal world, it's a quality plus farms plus potentially someone like Tristan Hill rushing the passer or, you know, Mike Purcell as being that backup nose tackle that can fill in space uh, next to Devon Godshaw. I think it's, it's going to have to be an all man, all hands on deck type situation to replace Barmore. And I don't love the idea of just plugging in a, you know, journeyman 30 year old defensive tackle and, and hoping that he can replicate the guy that you just paid, what $70 million to or whatever it was uh, on a, on a contract extension. So I, both of those good sleepers, Ziminez, I think, has been more consistent throughout the summer, um, mm -hmm. but not necessarily guys that you want to count on to be replacing, in a quality's case, Barmore, and if something were to happen with Matthew Judon, Ziminez. Uh, and we still don't know really what the solution to the Matthew Judon problem is going to be, but I'm still, like, I was talking to uh, Brian Barrett on, you know, the, the Ringer podcast last night. He was asking me what <laughs> I expect with Matthew Judon. I'm like, my answer hasn't really changed in three or four weeks. I expect them to figure out a deal with him, but it's been a long time at this point and nothing's happened. So um, I did think it was interesting that uh, Jeremy Fowler floated out there that teams had been calling the Patriots about the, about Matthew Judon and potential trade. Uh, there was no follow-up to that. There was no, that the Patriots have said no, or that the Patriots are interested. So we don't really still know um, anything beyond the fact that other teams are interested, but I don't know. I, I just can't foresee Judon playing for six and a half million dollars this year. And if for some reason he is off the roster before the start of the season, then someone like O'Shane Zimenez does become much more important to the team. Uh, so just to clarify, because there you, you drew an important line there. Zimenez is younger, less proven, not a journeyman like Daniel Aquale. Yes. Aquale is a sleeper in the fact that I don't think a lot of people know his name and I think will yeah. soon. It's more by virtue of the fact that he's just been starting every single period. Right. Uh, did the preseason opener that I think people should pay attention to him. Ziminus is the actual sleeper, late yeah. riser, also overlooked, headed not maybe for a breakout year, but is going to impact this team in a way that I don't think anyone, even beat writers, expected right after he signed or even going yeah. through the spring and in, in the summer. I threw him out once or twice, but I'm not going to um, play my flag on Ziminus <laughs> Hill and like take credit and say that I founded this place and kick off all the locals because, you know, I put it in writing first. Um, one last thought I had, which is now running away from me, just about the 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 defense, like I think it's fine. I mean, oh, <laughs> this was the thought. I don't want to talk about Matt Judon. I'm just, I'm waiting. Um, and this isn't, you know, because yeah. of anything recent or personal. I just we're all in wait and see mode. That's what happens. But if you do trade him, your pass rush is in deep trouble. Though Josh Uche got some run with the starters, mm -hmm. I will say yesterday and and produced with a sack, even a run stuff. Believe it or not, uh, against the Eagles. I just wouldn't worry about this defensive front as much. They are an injury away from real trouble, I would argue. But they're well coached. They have the system in place. Secondary is good. And they brought everyone back. And you look, you saw what it looked like last year. Still a top 10 defense. And you were the most injured defense in the whole league. If yeah. you just come back to average, they're going to be fine. Uh, okay, speaking of fine and injuries, we got two minutes. <laughs> So our team in this media flag football game, which was brought back for the first time since 2017, the year before I started on the beat, it used to be joint practices. You'd have the Patriots writers against the Saints or the Jaguars or the whomever other beat writers. So the Eagles come up, word gets to PR, because I'm in constant contact with Stacey James, uh, you know, about a variety of things that are PFWA president. And he's like, hey, there's one Eagles writer who wants to play with you guys. <laughs> so, we would have smoked him. I, yeah, we really would have. And he's like, do you want to just play on your own? I said, sure. I, I don't really want to take the lead on this game. And we played on the field at Gillette, which don't, don't get me wrong. Very cool. We had one game going. Tom Kern was our quarterback. He picked teams along with Mike Cadillac, who played backup, I think, at Worcester State, meaning quarterback. And we just had basically hockey shifts. Half of us played offense. The other half played defense. It was seven on seven. Went from the end zone to the 40. Again, a lot of fun. Ended, though, with the dislocated kneecap of Amit, longtime producer of this podcast and the engine that makes all of the CLNS Media Network go. And when I say dislocated kneecap, it was on the side of his knee. And this was from celebrating a pass breakup against our Zach Cox, who uh, had two touchdowns, was MVP. And Amit's fine. He's walking. It's snapped back into place. He's going to be okay. I just, <laughs> like, I don't know. It feels like Mad Libs that I just filled in describing this game. What did I miss? Um, didn't miss a whole lot. 
uh, I was bummed, like, despite Amit's injury, that we didn't get to finish the game. There was still 15 minutes left on the clock, but we did come away with a 2016 win. Yep. Um, I didn't allow a single reception. Uh, I didn't I did. even. I, w- I wasn't even targeted. Cadillac was terrified of me. Didn't even look my way. <laughs> Kite Island out there covering six foot six Kari Thompson. Still didn't look my way. Um, not a whole lot. Impressive performance, certainly uh, from from Tom Curran and Zach Cox. Uh, Zach was the number one pick, but great job by Tom picking his team. He picked a lot of the 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 older time beat writers, whereas Cadillac picked a lot of the the younger CLNS folks, and um, us old guys prevailed. That's all I yeah. got to say. It was a lot of fun. Uh, we're going to do something later as a beat. We just are really lucky to work with a lot of like fun people, and uh, not always the case when you work at different places. But we uh, we had good fun. Oh, Chris Mason, shout out! He would also oh, yeah. have been at the podium after the game for the interviews. Yep. Had a safety sacking Mike Cadillac, and I think one other sack. Yep. So Triple that's sacks. why I represent our pal Chris Mason. Oh, that's it coming up. Pop Douglas with another four minute drill. All the jokes you saw on Twitter about him breaking his hand or hurting hurting his hand because he caught a Joe Milton pass thrown too hard are true <laughs> coming up next thanks Doug. so it was a big day for pop douglas uh not just because he had the first three catches i think a team periods today here after patriots training camp but because he joins the four minute drill new segment of the pass interference podcast i told hunter henry last week i know four minute drills you're trying to run off the clock uh but here you're just answering questions football the non-football i'll start the clock and we'll go sound good let's get it all right appreciate you bro <laughs> yes sir so first question for pop doug let's hear in the four minute drill can you confirm the rumors the very serious real rumors that your hand injury was a result of joe milton just throwing you a pass uh, <laughs> that sounded too. Nah, yeah, working out. Yeah, we were working out in the summer together. Uh, he launched the ball. I go to get, go to grab it, and then I trip and fall on my hand. So I thought it was just it was too hard. It turns out that's actually true. This joke that we start the segment with <laughs> this leads to an actual some that's reporting. That's training together. That's crazy. Yeah. All right. Hope you don't get too much trouble here for that one. Let's no. go. Um, you told us late last year, I'll never forget this, in front of your locker room in a small scrum, that your name is actually spelled D-E capital M, yep. DeMario. Mm-hmm. What does it feel like when your name as a, an adult changes? How did you find out? What was it? What was that feeling like? Oh, how did I find out that M was capital M? Yeah, name? yeah. Your name suddenly you had been writing incorrectly your yes. whole life. Yeah, I was writing it incorrectly. I brought something home to my mama, and she was like, you know the M in your name, capital the whole time I was spelling my name with the lowercase m. The so time. were we. <laughs> it was crazy. Yeah. yeah. Did that settled now at the capital M? No, yeah. I, I write it capital M, yeah, since what that was, like third grade, fourth grade. That's when I found out. All right, back to football. Tell us about uh, a, a favorite concept. This could be high school. It could be college. It could be here in the NFL. What does the pass play look like, and what's your route? Um, Let's see. I say uh, post wheel. Post okay. wheel. I, I think I was scoring on a post wheel throughout my whole career. Yeah? Like, yeah, so hopefully I get a post wheel this year. So obviously you're <laughs> in the slot and running that wheel, you kind of go towards the sideline and then cut up and put on the afterburners. Yep, and I ran the post too. I was gonna score on both of those. All right, very good. So uh, players always talk about wanting to have a certain teammate in the Fox Hall. I love being in the trenches with this guy. He's got my back. Let's say Pop Douglas is in some kind of confrontation. Mm-hmm. Who's the receiver in the room? you least want at your back. Be like, ah, thanks for the help, but I, <laughs> this mm. guy, maybe not in the middle of the scrum. The least, who, least person I want? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. We got some dogs on the receiver. They, they, they mean. All dogs across the mean. board? Yeah. Uh, let me see. KB. KB. Okay. KB. <laughs> KB. 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 <laughs> KB. <laughs> All right. Very good. We're closing in here on the four-minute drill. Um, I need two names, two quarterbacks, mm-hmm. one that you faced last year and you really liked those reps going against this guy for whatever reason, got the best out of you. And the other one, you see him across the line. You're like, gosh. Cornerback? Cornerback, yep. Um, The one I like and the one I dislike? Yes. Uh, I say, I think uh, Bills, Teron Johnson. He, Teron he, Johnson. I think just because we see each other twice, yep. it's a good matchup. Uh, You talk about the one who I go against and I'm like, I'm going to kill He's like, I can't. Yeah, I, I just can't get around him. Who? Oh, I don't see nobody. And there no difficulties? No. No? No, I, uh-uh. I'm going to find a way to outwork. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to have to. It sounds like a receiver. A <laughs> couple more for Pop. we got about a minute left here in the minute drill. Uh, what is Pop Douglas doing when he gets home from a training camp practice like this one? What are you eating? What are you watching? Mm-hmm. Who are you hanging out with? Uh, I go, I, it depends on the day. So if I'm, like, really tired, I might go straight to the hotel. Oh. But if... <laughs> I'm going to get you. Key on Mike, <laughs> dropping in. If I don't, go, I'm on NCAA. Yeah? I get my NCAA in. Yep, I got a new NCAA. 
Okay, we're just going to stick with this because NCAA is on everyone's mind. Are you playing with Liberty? Who are you playing with? What kind of system? I'm kind of defeated on uh, with Liberty right now. I think I won one game. I play with Ole Miss and uh, PS5. All right, so spread. Yeah, PS5. Mm -hmm. Good man. All right, last question. We asked this to Hunter Henry. It's all in jest. What is your least favorite media question to get when you're talking to all of us at once? Um, say when it's about somebody else. Oh, why is that? Uh, just because, I mean, I don't want to say anything about anybody and then somebody turn it into something that is really not, you know. So I just wanted to keep it to myself. So if I say something about myself, I mean, y'all can do whatever with it. <laughs> yeah. We can even write your name incorrectly for the <laughs> right. first three quarters of the season, and it's cool. As long as it's not anyone else. You see what that says? Four minutes. Four minutes. This has been the four-minute drill for the Pats Interference <laughs> Podcast. Pop, my man, appreciate you coming on. Thank you. Yes, sir.